Lincoln School of Business at Lemoyne College makes extensive use of the materials contained in books written by myself and Fernando Dees. The books are Modern Security Analysis and Distress Investing. At Lemoyne, they think what Dees and I do comport with Jesuit moral principles. No gambling, especially most short run gambling and decisions are based on having obtained deep knowledge from the bottom up about companies and the securities they issue. Before Lemoyne, it never occurred to me that anything I was doing or was going to talk to you about was or was not moral. I was just happy that it was legal. <laughs> um, I got my insights into equity investing um, through my background in distress investing, where I spent many years starting in the early 70s. At first, I was a investor, but uh, I, I was a uh, professional getting fees, and then I decided to spend more time as an investor. It seemed a lot more profitable. Um, as an investor, oh, starting with um, things like the first mortgage bonds in the Penn Central bankruptcy and Eisner Brothers retail banking, I learned to concentrate on acquiring what was going to be the fulcrum security. The fulcrum security being, if you can identify it properly, the most senior security, usually a credit instrument, that's going to participate in the reorganization of a troubled company, whether out of court or in a court proceeding such as Chapter 11. Um, what it means, one of, one of my colleagues said, students really don't know what it means to participate in the reorganization. If a company is going to dramatically change its capitalization, that is a reorganization. Certain, many, many, uh, you probably don't know, senior securities are going to be reinstated. They're never going to miss a payment for principal interest or premium. Other securities like common stock and troubled companies might be wiped out. And uh, yet other securities, probably most securities, will participate in a reorganization where the claims they will get um, new instruments. Talking about one value area that may be in play today is um, um, upstream energy companies. Um, it's EMP uh, producing companies. The companies in general, uh, I'll just leave to give you an example, are among the most simple to reorganize. The energy industry, oil export, is not labor intensive. There are <clears throat> no pension plans to speak of and things that would gum up, make a reorganization complicated. Uh, there are very few trade creditors and normally 
many of these troubled energy companies, which seem likely to stay troubled, will be reorganized on a basis where the secured creditors, mostly banks, are reinstated. They don't miss anything. And the unsecureds who receive all or almost all the ownership interest in the reorganized company. And therefore, hopefully, hopelessly making it feasible. Anyway, that, that was my background that led to my great interest in value common stocks. Notice I said the key to my being an investor and mostly a very successful investor was to acquire the fulcrum security. Now I have a question for the class. If a company has a super strong financial position, what is the fulcrum security, the most senior security likely to participate in the reorganization? Anybody got a guess? It's called the common stock. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, therefore, much of what I'm going to talk about for the next hour or so revolves around the common stock as a fulcrum security. Um, the approach I'm going to talk about, hopefully, gives you two benefits. That's what it's designed for. One, I think what I do in common stocks is a really good method for passive investors enjoy to enjoy reasonably good rates of return over the long term. I've sort of retired from dealing with the public, and I'm not doing much else than managing my family's money, and we seem to be doing pretty well. I was certainly comfortable in uh, investing using the approach we're going to spend some time with. The second thing, and probably more important, that I would hope you would get out of this seminar is unlike conventional security analysis, conventional finance, which concentrates on the study of markets and prices, the things that we concentrate on, companies and intimate details about, intimate details about companies and the securities they issue are really, I think, essential training to be involved in most of what goes on in Wall Street. Believe it or not, it's not asset management, it's not mutual fund, it's other things. And I think uh, what I'm going to talk about serves as good background um, for that. And these other areas that hopefully will be helpful to you, um, certainly career-wise, as uh, I, I would characterize as one, value investing, two, active investing, three, control investing, four, distress investing, credit analysis, Next, and finally, first and second stage venture capital. Um, I would think the principles <coughs> that I expound are very, very relevant to those activities. Um, in my investment approach to get deep value. You can look at companies, it seems to me when you do an analysis, the emphasis 
which is 98% of Graham and Dodd and, and of Pariol analysis, is to look at companies as operations, day-to-day -day operations. Our, our emphasis in our analysis is we look at the companies as investment companies. And appraised managements, not only as operators, but also as investors and financiers. Uh, that's from whence value comes. In our, in my investment programs, in order for us to be interested in a common stock, it has to have four characteristics. <clears throat> First, a super strong the company has to be eminently credit worthy. If it's not credit worthy, I'll be a creditor, not a stockholder. The company has to be eminently credit worthy. Um, in conventional value analysis, or conventional most analysis in reading the paper, if there's a primacy of anything, it's the primacy of the income account to measure either periodic cash flows or periodic accounting earnings. Not so in what we do. If there's a primacy of anything, it's creditworthiness. Not earnings. Um, now, most of the eminently credit worthy businesses have strong financial positions and good balance sheets. But uh, when you deal with things, you have to deal with the real world. <coughs> and one of the things that makes businesses eminently credit worthy is super attractive access to capital markets on a, on a crazy price basis, which means that an awful lot of high tech companies, because of the access to almost free money for equity, uh, meet a lot of our criteria and practically every one of them, starting from Google, <coughs> Apple, Amazon to small players, are characterized by super strong financial positions. So we got topic number one covered. Yes. All right, topic number two for what's essential for what we do. The common stock has to be available at a price that represents a meaningful discount, say 20% or more from readily ascertainable net asset value. Um, what we do, I think, is a prickly appropriate for income producing real estate financial institutions, <coughs> and in some sense, high tech. I think our type of analysis with an emphasis on quantitative net asset value is a lot more difficult if you do plain vanilla manufacturing businesses or retail enterprises. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have a long, long background in retail, and except maybe for Walmart, it's very hard to identify any retail company as credit worthy uh, between their 
dealing with the trade, the landlords, and the banks, most of them get into deep trouble when they don't make plan. It is a very difficult business. When I was teaching at Yale in the 90s, I had the class do an assignment, um, go into what was then a, uh, a, a book uh, of company, a directory of companies filing 10Ks, which was then further broken down by industries. And I'd asked the class, is the end of the 90s, a, a very, very prosperous period, would they please look at the file and come back in a few weeks and tell me which of the retailers prospered and which had to reorganize either out of court or in a bankruptcy proceeding. For every Walmart, which had prospered, there was a federated department of stores, a Zare, a Caldor, a Chess King. Uh, the truth is, most of them didn't make it, and most of them <laughs> nowadays seem to uh, not, not hold much promise for the common stock. Um, they have to either reorganize or liquidate. But um, there are, we, or my family, with a concentration on income producing real estate, get into blue chips, blue chip real estate at prices <clears throat> that represent anywhere from a 50% discount to an 85% discount. Um, I'll discuss that in a minute. Uh, but I, just before I came here, I read the annual report a lifelong holdings, which I suggest you might want to read. In Hong Kong dollars, the stock sells at 12 cents. The book is 84 cents. And the earnings are something like six and a half cents. <coughs> on new, huge projects coming on stream. Not the best finance company in the world, but adequately finance. I, I suggest you might read that for an idea of what pricing can be. We'll definitely uh, take a look. Huh? We'll, we'll definitely take a look. Yeah, like Fung holding it. It's on... Uh, Standard & Poor's uh, listed on the Hong Kong exchange. Um, to digress a, a moment and to talk about how the life funds of this world exist. If you go back to the University of Chicago, they have some crazy theory <coughs> that markets are efficient. <laughs> the, truth, the truth is some markets are highly efficient and some markets are highly inefficient. Both is measured as a standard of what underlying value would be if there were changes of control or going private or resource conversion events. Um, and what happens in a place 
like Hong Kong, <clears throat> as there are virtually no prospects for changes of control, <clears throat> and they don't have Delaware law, it's virtually impossible to go private. So therefore, you get a market which is efficient. It's not efficient <coughs> in any value sense. It's efficient in a process sense. Yeah, uh, you can say those companies, that th those prices just couldn't exist in the United States where we have too much of an army of very sophisticated investment bankers promoting deals. You go, and you have Delaware law that permits going privates so that uh, you can get these uh, huge bargains versus value uh, and these discounts are very, very common. If those of you taking a look, uh, one of the, a huge problem for U.S. taxpayers in buying <coughs> shares at huge discounts are the existence of PFIC tax laws. Per, person, uh, uh, passive finance investment companies overseas. The law was originally introduced to prevent hedge funds from all going to the Cayman Islands and not paying taxes. But what it does, badly drafted law, attracts um, in cases some of the best blue chips in the world. Uh, as prefix to wit, uh, two examples, Investor AB in Sweden, a huge, huge value, and Toyota Industries, really the parent of Toyota Motor <coughs> in Japan. Uh, the thing about a prefix, among the many disadvantages, was if your U.S. taxpayer owns a PFIC, you pay ordinary income tax every year on the unrealized depreciation during the years where it's very hard to own things like Investor AB or Toyota Industries. Again, those are two things for you to look at if you're not a U.S. <laughs> Taxpayer. Right. <laughs> All right, so the second thing is buy at a discount. Um, very, very important third factor. <coughs> you want there to be full disclosure in English about the securities you're buying and you want them traded in markets that are highly regulated so that you as an outside passive investor <coughs> don't get screwed. Right. Um, also, I like audits by the big four. Very, very reliable. And uh, that pretty much restricts what we do in deep value to the US, Canada, Hong Kong, Netherlands, England, and uh, ADRs from places like Germany the types of thing I'm talking about <coughs> are really not helpful in emerging markets. So that's the third thing. But notice 
on those first three criteria before I get to the fourth. Very strong financial position. Discount from readily ascertainable net asset value. Easy under IFRS accounting if you're doing income producing real estate and easy for financial institutions. <coughs> and full disclosure in well-disciplined markets. Those three things are not rocket science. They're pretty easy. <coughs> They're pretty easy to determine. And uh, later on, maybe I'll recite a whole list of securities that I think meet those criteria. The fourth standard very important. However, takes a lot of analytic judgment. To wit, we pretty much restrict investments to areas where most of the time we think the prospects are good, that over the next three to five years, the NAV will increase by at least 10% a year compounded after adding back dividends or where we think there are reasonable prospects for resource conversion, changes of control, spin-offs, going privates, um, <clears throat> if you want to invest in any of these huge cheap discounts that we're doing in China and uh, Hong Kong and some extent Japan, I think you ought to rely on the fact that your appreciation and your bailout <coughs> revolves around their ability increase NAV because as far as I can tell resource conversion is very hard to accomplish. I ought to mention something about going private so you understand why it's pretty good in the U.S. Uh, all the leverage buyouts are forms of going private with your cash out. <coughs> the common stockholders. Over 50% of the company, public companies in the U.S. are incorporated in Delaware. And therefore, you can do a force out merger with the records that both outlined in the charter and bylaws usually 50%, <coughs> and as far as I can tell, never more than two-thirds. So that, um, again, let's go to Lifefung and say it's a Delaware corporation. Right. Real, uh, readily ascertainable books, 84 cents. The stock sells at 12 cents. Would you get the requisite proxy vote in Delaware to take the thing private at 25 cents? I suspect you would. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, dub, double, double the market, but still only a third of underlying value. But in Hong Kong, in order to do the same merger transaction, you need the affirmative vote of 90% of the stockholders who are not going to participate in the merger transaction. So uh, there's no way you can go private in Hong Kong doing LBO 
uh, without having a holdout problem. I got to tell you, uh, obviously, uh, I did the lifelong example. My family <coughs> owns enough to block any <laughs> you know, we would we would not accept twenty five cents, and we're very friendly with the management. We're very very close with them. As a matter of fact, they're visiting us Tuesday. Uh, but that that's the fact of life. Um, if you want to invest there, the fact that there's this. Pediment, I don't think, means that the market is efficient. It's efficient in a process point of view. And it's easy to go private, but it's not efficient in a value point of view. What a willing control buyer would pay a willing control seller, both with the knowledge of relevant facts and neither any, under any compulsion to act. <coughs> so, um, um, there are a plethora of investment opportunities where you buy these kind of values. Not as deep as life on <laughs> oh no, my son. Hey, Evan. Um, well, my son's the same 85% discount. I don't know. A lot of them. And look like they have the same growth prospects. They, they outline uh, someone like Lai Fung uh, now owns and manages 2.9 million square feet in mainland China, and they're expanding to 9 million square feet. As you can read in the annual report, obviously big beta. Um, <clears throat> so anyhow, let me uh, now Oh, before I do, let, let, let me clue you in on something in value investing. I think I know that there has been a disclosure revolution that traces back, in my opinion, <coughs> the Securities Acts Amendments of 1964 the U.S. securities law. And is now, as an outside passive investor, to know so much more about so many companies than Graham and Dodd ever dreamed possible. It was just on their radar screen. I mean, um, they were earnings conscious and basically top down, but they never had the advantage that we have today just from the public record being able to get so much information about public companies. When you read the Life Fung, it's just going to be a preliminary annual report that will come out with a big glossy thing. I got to tell you, it's more information than you want to know. Okay. Because disclosure is so good, and you people can take advantage of it, uh, I think, I know, without it, active investing and takeover investing would not have been possible. And now, because just from the public record, you can know so much you can be so well informed about so many companies that it's possible for you to graduate from passive value investing 
to doing control investing, to doing active investing. You got the tools at your command. You know, it used to be you couldn't do things unless you had non-public information. <coughs> the things were just good enough. And if you're in a hostile environment, having non-public information is obviously a showstopper. That's how you prevented the takeover. They, they can't buy any stock pads and find information. Things have changed so much when you read 10Ks, when you read annual reports, when you read proxy statements, then you can become extremely well performed about a lot of companies. One of the things I love about us having an investment company approach, it's easier and more comprehensive to really get extremely well informed compared with trying to get the same degree of information in a plain operating company. It's just it's just easier. There's nothing you can't do it in an operating company. So anyway, uh, there is that fact if you concentrate on we what we do <coughs> I said before, it ought to be useful to you in your career for things other than being a mutual fund management. <laughs> to be useful for most things to what go on in Wall Street. Now, let me um, take some time out now to name names, uh, documents you might want to read. Brookfield Asset Management, uh, they just had a comprehensive investor day and put out a large, a huge investor brochure, extremely informative. I think they think stocks in the low 30s I think they got statements in there saying they think in five years it's going to be worth 150. You know, who knows? But anyway, it's a good read. Willock and Company annual report. <coughs> you will know more about real estate and retail shopping centers in Hong Kong mainland China, Singapore, and you possibly could care to know <laughs> stock in the mid thirties and the IFRS NAV is about 100 and 99 and change. Let's talk about IFRS appraisal values. Uh, in the United States under GAAP, if you deal in income producing real estate, it's accounted for based on depreciated historic cost, less impairments. <coughs> Under IFRS, real estate, both washed through the income account and the balance sheet, is carried at independently arrived at appraised values for completed and operating properties. Now, in doing an independent appraisal, you arrive at values by looking at the income approach 
that's discounting the present value estimated future cash flows, a market approach, or a replacement cost approach. As is pointed out in the Henderson Land Development uh, Annual Report, the emphasis they have and most appraisers have on um, arriving at appraisal value is a discounted cash flow, the income approach. So on existing income properties, if Wheelock tells you that their NAV is 100, doesn't that mean on existing properties, which are subject to long-term leases, you know, you're not really gambling, future earnings from those properties will be see, 8 to $12 a share. That's pretty good on a $35 stock which is currently selling around three times earnings. So I suggest you look at Willock. Let's talk about what's wrong with Willock. <laughs> and, well, I, I, price of 35, reported earnings of 11, NAV of about 100. Wheelock is a super successful company that I've been in for many, many years. But it does 11%, or had done um, up until recently, 11% of all the retail trade done in Hong Kong had been done in shopping centers owned and operated by Wheelock. A lot of it shopping, I don't know, remember what percent, but very substantial was from Chinese mainland tourists. Now, with a strong dollar and the Chinese mainly in crackdown and corruption. <coughs> it looks like uh, Hong Kong shopping, which I think of traffic's off three to five percent, will be down this year. Um, Really, if you're a long-term buy-and-hold investor, that ought not to be a big concern. Willock, Willock's principal subsidiary is erecting five huge shopping centers in mainland China that are coming on stream this year and next year, year after. Um, that dwarf what they've got in Hong Kong. But um, one of the very important things about buying these discounts is I think the stocks we have been buying as <clears throat> discounts from net asset value haven't been this cheap since 1974, 2008. Wow. I mean, uh, we're like at a six, over 60% discount. I think people miss a lot of things that you as MBA students should not. To wit, 
conventional wisdom for most of 2015 is sell China. They're going into rough economic times. They don't analyze the companies we're involved with, like Wheelick and Chongqing. I'll tell you what happens in most bad times. Is cash rich, well managed companies are going to be able to and are going to make acquisitions of assets and companies and knock down prices. As Wheelock bought a uh, was a 25% interest on one of the leading home builders in mainland China. during the last bus. But it's important in your analysis that you just not look at operations, but you look at companies as potential investors and potential financiers. And someone like Wheelock at a 60% discount, it's pretty hard to get in trouble. I, I mean, one of the funny things I should say, whether it's Lifeung <coughs> or Brookfield or Willock, believe it or not, despite all these statistics I give you, each of these companies and the rest I'm going to mention seem to raise a dividend every year. <laughs> And I guess some of them, now, I don't pay attention to dividends, but some of them pay dividends 3 or 4%. Um, to the name names, Brookfield, Willock, Lifung, Henderson Land Development, NN Group, a Dutch insurance company. Uh, yeah. I mentioned Brookfield, C.K. Hutchison, which is basically a European company now. It's headquartered in Hong Kong, but it's enlisted in Hong Kong. <coughs> but a majority of his assets are in Europe container ports, utilities. I think the largest um, um, mobile phone operator in Europe. And you buy all these at very, very substantial discounts. All right, let me just digress for a moment and talk about the University of Chicago (laughs) and this myth of the efficient market. The truth is, as you all know, from a value point of view, certain markets are highly efficient and certain markets are extremely inefficient. Even they are beginning to recognize that. Extremely efficient markets are those populated by what I call sudden death securities, where there's a near term termination event, and you analyze by looking at only a few computer programmable variables. That includes options, warrants, merger arbitrage, convertible arbitrage, cash tender offers. When you deal in those markets, the highly efficient markets, and you're trying to grab eights and sixteenths. That has nothing to do with your long-term buy and holder 
of a going concern. Um, let me please explain why the, general, the way things are appraised in the general market are absolutely inappropriate for understanding the types of securities I've mentioned that we buy and I recommend to you if you're looking for satisfactory long-term performance. The general market is characterized by four factors, and this includes Graham and Dodd, that are really not relevant to understanding a business and its long-term prospects. The first, for conventional analysts, there is a primacy of the periodic income account, whether the measure cash flows or earnings. Two, there's an emphasis on prices. University of Chicago is basically a study of markets and prices. It's beyond me how you can study prices and be long-term conscious and try and understand the business long-term. The definition of being price conscious, share price conscious, is you have to be short term. The price changes every day, every hour, every minute. So it's impossible. And, uh, and it also gets very, very hard to be long term if you think the market sends you value messages. <clears throat> you better yourself get detailed knowledge of what you're investing in. So between primacy, the income account, and short-termism, it's very hard to say, I'll take a shot at Lifefung Holdings or I'll take a shot at Wheelock. Very hard. And those of you, have, how many of you have read Graham and Dodd security analysis? Yeah, one of, they're basically top down. He says the first thing you do is have an opinion on the outlook for markets, the outlook for interest rates, the Dow Jones average. Not so in value investing as I see it. The first thing you do is understand the company. Um, I know, by the way, if I'm wrong about China, for example, it's not going to be for economic reasons. It's going to revolve around social unrest, physical violence in the street, things really not on my radar screen. But the norm is for investing in China, almost no matter what the economic <coughs> outlook the companies we have analyzed from the bottom up, whether Lifefung, Wheelock, Henderson Land, Hanglung Group, their future will be determined by things from the bottom up, not the top down factors. The economies go work well enough 
and it doesn't. Your ability to acquire assets on the cheap are going to probably make some of them big winners. Oh. Marty, can you, Go ahead. Marty, can you talk a little bit about how you think about allocating capital across these different kinds uh, of properties? Can you talk a little bit about how you think about portfolio construction and allocating capital across these different opportunities? I don't diversify. Right. All right. I think that's a refuge of cowards. I <laughs> would say you, you want to diversify as recommended. Right. If you don't know anything about the security in which you're investing, and uh, if you don't know anything about the security in which you're investing, and you don't have any confidence in your judgment about the business, let's say in my family's, one of my family's portfolio, principal portfolio, with 25% in Wheelock. Wow. I don't know. I guess twelve percent in life on. It's um it's very, very hard to get superior performance if you diverse I believe you know, if you're Eugene Farmer, of course you should diversify. Right. You don't know the first fucking thing about uh, the company yeah. you're investing in. You know, well you say the market's efficient. By the way, speaking to Jesuits, <laughs> to Jesuits no, I don't know if, if you're Jesuits, it is pretty atrocious that whole financial systems put a premium on being ignorant. Right. That's the efficient market. Boy, is that anti-Jesuit to say, I'm going to invest and not know anything about the companies. I don't have to know anything. The market will tell me. Ask me, that's a cardinal sin. Right. <laughs> and you don't have to be part. But once we do that, I, I don't diversify. I do diversify in the sense um, that if you're not control investors, you never know enough and there is always enough uncertainty that you ought to have some diversification, but ought to, it, ought, it ought to not to be anything like what academic finance departments say it ought to be, because much of what they do is based on ignorance. Right. They're, absolutely, they're absolutely right. If all you're going to do is study markets and security prices, you should merge, diversify like Markowitz. You know, like Mark would just, but what's it got to do with this lecture? Speaking of that, um, what I do as a passive investor would not work very well with borrowed money. Right. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, take Life Fung, which right. are very big holders in. Uh, this year, I originally bought it at 18 and 19 cents a share and it went down to where it is now 12 cents that i've been leveraged it might be a cause for concern you know the way things are now i just buy more you know, have the courage your conviction sets don't rely on me for diversification and vice I got in the mutual fund business in 1984 by doing a hostile takeover of a closed end trust, selling at a discount, and then open ended it. And as soon as I became a mutual fund, I started buying up the banks the bank debt in a uh, company in Chapter 11 called Anglo Energy. 
I eventually reorganized the country in an all equity reorganization and changed its name to Neighbors Industries, which to this day is the world's largest land driller and a leading company. So I was so intent in if you're going to participate in a bankruptcy, uh, it's very important to own or otherwise tie up one third of the class. So then you got a veto <laughs> over the bankruptcy reorganization subject to cram down. So I was so anxious to control over a third of the bank debt, which I eventually did. But equity strategies, which bought, which was a mutual fund bought out of the bank, was the only mutual fund in the world that was taxed as a C corporation. It never could get the requisite diversification to be an N corporation. This is the late 80s. To have get the requisite diversification, I would have had to have attracted three hundred million dollars in new funds at that time beyond my wildest dreams. So that uh, we finally got out of the bind by uh, merging equity strategies into neighbors industries and all equity strategies holders got neighbor stock for a buck or less for but that but uh in that sense I was a huge failure in the mutual fund industry. You know <laughs> though really very successful. I was right. a huge failure <laughs> in that I was never able to take advantage of the tax breaks sure. in mutual funds. I I never you know it was not on my radar screen to the diversify enough. It was more important to get control. Okay, uh, the fourth thing that conventional security analysis does that really detracts from being a value investor is it grows out of the efficient market guys a belief in equilibrium pricing. I mean that the price represents a fair value and will only change as the market impacts new information. That may be a valid observation for sudden death securities, but if everything else is pure bullshit. <laughs> but there's a lot of reliance, a lot of reliance on it. But anyway, that, that's why conventional analysis is really not very helpful. Um, I must say, in a praising, having emphasis on looking at in the companies in which we invest is basically investment companies. We're not any different than Berkshire Hathaway, not any different than Lowe's, which, by the way, is a pretty big discount. Low sink. And if you read uh, the Berkshire annual report and believe in what Buffett says on the unreported values, Berkshire may be at a discount. Uh, but uh, uh, what I'm not, what, what I'm talking to you folks about is not off the wall. You'll find a uh, tremendous number of companies that think 
just the way I'm describing things to you, starting with Berkshire Hathaway and going to, I don't know, Lowe's, General Electric. They think of their operations as portfolio companies. <coughs> Okay, while I concentrate on buying at a discount from that asset value, by and large, the returns on equity in our companies are not materially different than the typical companies. So the Dow Jones Industrial Average and S&P 500 sell about three times book reporting in Barron's every week and, I don't know, 15 to 17 times earnings. <laughs> Willock, <clears throat> Willock and Hang Long selling at 60 and 85% discounts also are selling at two times and three times reported earnings. So I went through the four criteria. The fact of life is that in over 80% of the cases in the Dow Jones average, was a standard poor's 500. The NAV will be larger in the last reporting period than it was in the prior reporting period. For how well financed companies I haven't done the numbers, <coughs> but it's probably well over 90%. So suppose that statistic is valid, as I believe the great odds are there ought to be. It doesn't guarantee any return, but insofar as it is valid, you will have satisfactory performance on a long-term basis as long as the discounts don't widen and stay widened. I got to say on what we're doing as of October 1st, 2015, the discounts have never been as wide as they are, as they were on October 1st. I guess the stocks rallied the last few days but, but in general, for long-term buy and hold investor, you can buy into these blue chips, these well-financed blue chips at historically bigger discounts than have existed since 2008 and a lot of ways since 1974. That's a situation that exists uh, and who knows, maybe we'll get lucky on resource conversion. There would be changes of control or going private. But don't hold your breath. Hong Kong and China are culturally very different and Japan, United States, Canada, and in some extent even South Korea. In that, in China and Hong Kong, the companies are all controlled by billionaire families, unlike 
let's say US and Canada uh, and Japan where there's shareholder control or employee control but China one, one of I, I don't view it as a problem um, is the founders of these billionaire companies are all aging. Um, Kaling, Li, Qi, Shirley Qi are all in their 80s. And uh, Peter Wu just ceded control of uh, Willock to his son, Doug, a graduate of Princeton and Northwestern, who I think is okay. <laughs> I think he's pretty good. But uh, <clears throat> there will be changes in management that I could tell without changes of control. You gotta, in order to get a satisfactory investment in these things, you have to rely on growth in NAV. You know, maybe some narrowing of the discount, but it's unlikely that if there were American companies, these quality businesses at these discounts just wouldn't exist. Okay, I want to give you a, a very important thing. I want to state that certainly eases my analysis, and that's to talk about earnings. Unlike most of Wall Street, <coughs> earnings consists of two things. It's either net cash flows from periodic operations, or more commonly, there's something you ought to focus on, the creation of wealth while consuming cash. This is what most companies do and it's over concentration on the internal generation of cash really isn't very helpful. One of the things, as I stated at the beginning, <clears throat> is very helpful to creating value is to be in companies that have access to capital markets at super attractive bases, either high tech companies or US real estate companies which have access to the long term mortgage market on slowly amortizing debt low interest rate and non-recourse. Uh, so that there are probably more real estate billionaires in the United States than any other single class of billionaires in great part because they get such attractive financing and none of them pay taxes <laughs> for control. But just as a reminder to you people as value investors, insofar as you pass them a vast majority of the time, and as exists in Hong Kong, 
real estate securities tend to be a hell of a lot cheaper than real estate. In the U.S., you get a bailout when when the real estate securities turn into real estate. <coughs> Whether that will be true in Hong Kong and China, I don't know. I, I doubt it. One of the, uh, in comparison, by the way, one of the disadvantages, two of the disadvantages of China and Hong Kong compared with the U.S. is in Asia, there's very little non-recourse financing. Some, but very little, unlike the U.S. And two, leases tend to be for much shorter terms than they are in the U.S., which gives you a higher beta for improved rentals, but also gives you more downside. Even so, who pays attention when you're buying at a 60% discount? <laughs> All right, I'm going to shock you now. A, a, a very important lesson to learn. In the aggregate, in the history of the country, in the history of our companies, in the history of our governments, debt is almost never repaid. In fact, alive, despite all these Republican budget balances in the history of the government, the history of debt is never repaid. What happens, it is refinanced and expanded as far, insofar as the borrowing entity becomes more and more credit worthy. That's just a fact of life and what exists. Let us, on each of the stocks I've recommended that we're doing in value investing, today they all have considerably more borrowing capacity than they had in the past. They're increasingly credit worthy. They don't borrow a lot. Is it, but uh, it is available, and that's a dynamic you ought to take with you, whatever you do in your careers. If, remember that debt in the aggregate is almost never repaid, and there's not the individual, any individual debt instrument, of course, matures. But it is refinanced and expanded. Another comment. Marty, can you talk oh. a little bit? Huh? Uh, could, you, could you talk a little bit about how you generate investment ideas? You know, you, you've talked about a bunch of these wonderful ideas. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, you found them or how you, your process of finding ideas in general? I don't know the more ideas you say, because mostly reading documents, reading mm -hmm. newspapers, talking to people. Um, It's not how I really don't know where all the deal, the neighbors deal, that right. organization. A close friend of mine, Bob Morgenthau, a sort of celebrity, was on an aeroplane and the seat next to him was held by some officer in Anglo Energy. And he said to Bob, you ought to look at Anglo Energy, and Bob told me he was on this plane. And the guy said, look at Anglo Energy. <laughs> that was the birth of neighbors in this 
it, it, it comes from it comes from a lot of places. I, I think, as I said before, uh, you know, unlike Raymond Dodd, they, the disclosure environment is so good. Right. Um, there's more stuff. I look at. I'm 91 and getting lazy. <laughs> you know, not working too hard, but uh, if I wanted to, I could examine a lot more. Just look at company reports, you know, and come through on uh, Standard Poor's IQ. Right. Wall Street Journal's is seed of a lot of ideas. Does anyone have questions? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, thanks for joining us, Mr. Women. Um, just a quick question. You mentioned that you don't like to diversify, so you have four or five names. How long do you wait to make a, a move on a position? Do you, and do you just sit on a lot of cash while you wait? Yeah, I, I guess so. Mo mostly we're fully invested. You know, I, I, I mean, I don't pay that much attention to performance since I can have so much confidence in the businesses. I think <clears throat> with my investment style, down markets, we suffer as much or more than anybody else. <laughs> I gave you the uh, Lifung example, 19 to 12 or 11 at the low. Nothing to do with the performance of the business. It had to do, nobody wanted to own Chinese stocks. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I just, I haven't, I haven't figured out the market well enough. I think I figured out the companies. So uh, if we got stuff, I pretty much stay fully invested and don't invest in the stocks and, and don't uh, hold a lot of cash. Remember by background, I started out in the distress business and there are always great opportunities if you're willing to be a creditor, either buying performing loans that are going to stay performing loans or buying the fulcrum security that's going to participate in the reorganization. Um, I, uh, you know, we do a principal problem I have with fulcrum securities is they're not worth a damn unless you can bring reasonably good managements to the reorganized company. And it's a place where I think we've fallen short. Let me just make a few comments and then we'll uh, wind up. All financial accounting misleads in one sense or another. Accrual accounting misleads because it is unrelated to the cash experience. Cash accounting misleads because it fails to describe the wealth creation experience. In other words, accounting is essential, but it's not an answer. It's a tool you use to determine your version of reality. It's a series of objective benchmarks. It doesn't tell you what's real for your purposes. You have to use it as a tool to find out. I had a bad experience this weekend. I read uh, Ben Bernanke's biography. <laughs> former chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. 
guy's an economist. He doesn't have a clue about restructuring troubled financial institutions. He thinks if they can't pay their bills, they go out of business. And he's very frightened of the common cliche that you've all heard, a company is too big to fail. What other nonsense, it's not too big to fail. Any company can be too important not to be reorganized expeditiously and economically. Very, very important. Uh, unlike Bernie, company banks don't go out of business. They're restructured and reorganized. A holding company may go out of business, but no banks are going out of businesses. They will be structured. Interestingly enough, the government sort of recognize what I say in that certain companies are too important not to be reorganized expeditiously uh, and economically. They have systematically important companies that have to have living wills. In other words, be prepared for a fast reorganization. It's, I'm sure they never consulted Bernanke reading the book, because while it's a good book in many respects, it's very important he doesn't understand about restructuring. Uh, in the questions the students prepared after reading your books and, and, and reading uh, interviews you've done online, there were a lot of questions by the students around how you evaluate management or if there are any things that you look for in management um, and your process of doing that. Could you touch upon that? Good question. Yeah, okay. I don't think there's any question I screw up in the appraisal <laughs> management more than any place else. But it is important for you to note in the appraisal of management that the public record is now so good. You go into a proxy statement, you know, all the forms of compensation and what they're doing and certain transactions, inside of transactions. Uh, before I ever talk to a management and try to appraise them, uh, boy, I read the proxy statement cover to cover, and I suggest you too. It's a um, great thing to start to understand about managements, how they get paid, how old they are, what their background is, and uh, I, I'm sorry, when I say I screw up more in management than any place else, uh, my problems I think have been in distress in the common stock companies I'm in. Basically, I, I've had luck with terrific, terrific managements. I've been very lucky there. Where I've screwed up, let's say, uh, oh, a big screw up was uh, I reorganized Herman's Sporting Goods oh. uh, in Chapter 11, had the wrong management, and pretty soon it was in Chapter 22. <laughs> <laughs> yes, second time in 11 and liquidated. Yeah. Uh, I, but, yeah, but generally I'd say, uh, but starting with the proxy stand, the public record is so good. My record in good grade common stocks in appraising management I think is pretty good. My record in uh, distress is much more mediocre. There's a broad array of students in the room from, you know, senior college finance majors to uh, students studying for their MBA. Uh, is there any advice that you would give them as they sort of pursue a career and 
in investing in value investing the course you know the course is built around value investing but is there any advice you would give them broadly yeah, you know what I, I used to be when i was teaching at yale i used to advise students the biggest thing single thing i would say to an mba student it is very important to study accounting, financial accounting in depth, maybe maybe managerial accounting as well. But the language of business and the one thing that's highly disciplined is accounting. And I think it's a, a totally important prerequisite for everything we're talking about. As a matter of fact, in my dealing with other account academic institutions, I find that economic departments at universities tend not to be worth a damn unless they have business schools <laughs> attached. And the thing about business schools that I think is so important is accounting. You know, and also learn learn conventional finance, but the emphasis is on financial accounting and maybe managerial accounting, depending on what to do, maybe government accounting. That's kind of the old, old, old academic advice I've been given. Are there are there any books that have heavily influenced you over your career? mentioned, you know, Graham and Dodd, but other books that have influenced your thinking? Well, let's see. Charlie Munger wrote a great book called uh, uh, Damn Right. Right, yeah, it's a great book. Yeah, it's a good, good introduction to restructuring. Yeah, I've been a, a lot of books. I wish my five books are pretty good. <laughs> 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 Well, we, a lot of which I, I stole from Charlie Munger, I know. Right. We've read them and, and they're, some of them are on the curriculum, so that's good. Uh, I said, we've read them and some of them are on the curriculum for this course, so that's good. We, uh, we are just incredibly grateful for you sharing your wisdom with us today. Uh, and it really- I, I thank you for having me. <laughs> Really a pleasure.